So, good morning, everybody. Welcome to day number five, Blue Innovation Doc, day number five, Boat Düsseldorf. Feels like day five or day seven already. I don't know. So, but today is a very packed and interesting day here at the Blue Innovation Doc. Um, we will start with the two presentations, then we have two panels, presentations in between, so non-stop program today from 11 to 3 o'clock. Um, we will start with a presentation, EU Roadmap for End-of-Life Boats. We have two speakers here, Andy Kontukadaki from Greece, Policy Officer Maritime Innovation, Marine Knowledge and Investment, European Commission. She will do the second part, and the first part will be done by Philip Easthill, Secretary General, European Boating Industry. Welcome, Philip. Thank you. Thank you, Marcus. I think after five days, maybe everyone should know me, but uh, you never know. Thank you. So good morning, everyone. Uh, I have the pleasure of um, presenting what uh, we have been working on uh, with the European Commission in the past good three and a half years, uh, which is the, the recommendations for an EU, EU roadmap on end-of-life boats. So I will very quickly run through this, and then we will have Andy Kontodakis uh, from the European Commission to give the initial response uh, on what this means from the European Commission side. So a few numbers just to, to set the stage for today and for this discussion. Um, some few key figures, which we have also in our roadmap. Um, marine, um, which includes commercial users, about 72 kilotons of Composite, that's around 2 to 3 percent of composite use in Europe. We have a fleet of 6.5 million boats on average in Europe. Most of those are small boats, as we know, um, not the big super yachts in, in hall number one, but more the smaller ones that we have in the neighboring hall here. The lifetime is minimum lifetime is maybe 40 to 50 years. And this is some of the, the new data that we brought out in the roadmap. Um, we estimate that there are around 30 to 40,000 boats reaching the end of life every year until about 2030. That's the timeline that we wanted to make estimates for. And the amount of um, composite waste that has to be dismantled and then recycled every year is around 33,000 to 30,000 tons. Um, in France, which has a very well-established end-of-life system, APER, 72% uh, of waste today is being, is being subject to some sort of recycling. Um, how did we develop this roadmap? The idea was to have a real strategic approach uh, on tackling this issue and removing the major bottlenecks in member states and legislation at European level from the industry side to this issue to solve it by 2030. That's the timeline we have. So that's why we had the, the huge pleasure to organize this joint stakeholder group with the European Commission, with the DG Mare, and it was a real collaborative process, a public-private partnership. We involved all the stakeholders, we had a series of, of meetings with experts from industry, users, academia, recycling companies, and other related industries who are also here today, which I'm very happy about. In December, we officially submitted these recommendations uh, to the Commissioner Virginia Sinkevicius, uh, and we expect an, an official reply very soon. Um, I just want to give, uh, again, a bit of um, scene setting um, to show a bit the, the fleet of boats that we have in Europe according to estimates. So there's a few countries where we don't have any data, but those are definitely also the, um, the countries with a not such a big boat park. But on the left-hand side, you see those countries with a very large boat park, and I think this is interesting, first of all, uh, and quite encouraging, second of all, because it shows that we maybe have to really, to solve the issue in most countries, for most of Europe, we only have to tackle about eight or nine or ten countries. So we don't have to set up a, a real system in all countries, but we have to tackle some key countries to find a solution. So this is a first draft of what it will look like, the roadmap. Um, I don't want to go into detail on everything because it will be published, we'll put out a press release, and then you can read it in detail, and uh, Andy in a minute will also say a few words about this as well. But the five major issues that we have in there is financing, how do you pay for this? There's very many different approaches that can be imagined and are being used. Dismantling and, and transport, um, developing data, the recommendations are on, on developing a dismantling system. There are some issues at European level in the regulation, in the re uh, waste framework directive that we need to solve. Um, the boat removal is an issue. We need to develop on-site dismantling technologies. All of these issues come under that category. Under recycling, we will, uh, and this is here at the bottom of the slide, as an industry, as boating industry in Europe, we will commit ourselves 
uh, to phase out landfilling and also energy recovery of composite waste by 2030 and move up towards higher value recycling technologies. So this is also in there. I'll come back to that in a second. Uh, on research and innovation, um, we also have some recommendations in there, mainly also what needs to happen at European level uh, on how to develop research and innovation funding that can tackle this issue uh, and many other areas as well. But I know Andy will talk about this as well in a minute. Um, we also want to include the, the issue of life cycle analysis. How can this be part of the solution? And then lastly, one of the recommendations is to develop an EU network on end-of-life boats with all of the countries that already have a system in place or want to develop one so that we can work in the same direction and have a European approach. So this is um, something that, that may be discussed also later on in the panel discussion, but this is kind of how we see the pathway to 2030 and to 2050 on this recycling of composite waste. So our, our sort of three timelines are 2025, 2030, and 2050. Um, what we're doing at the moment is, is less sustainable, and we want to phase that out, as I said earlier. We want to phase out energy recovery, just burning the material as energy source, and landfill as well, of course. This is also taken from the European legislation, this inverted pyramid. And then we want to move up this pyramid towards more sustainable solutions, going towards recycling through cement co-processing, which already um, removes raw material use and also removes CO2 emissions from the cement production, which is something fantastic that we want to encourage. And of course, later on, we want to move towards other recycling technologies, which we will hear also in the course of the day and want to promote those. And of course, the most sustainable thing is to use that boat as long as possible. Boats are used 40 to 50 years. If we refit them and we can make them more sustainable, we can use them much longer, and that's the best thing to do. So this is kind of a timeline that we want to work towards as an industry and that we also commit ourselves to do. I've taken this picture here from, uh, from APER, which is the, the French dismantling network, because I think it shows very well what we want to do. We want to create the APRE, the after. We want to remove those old boats and, and make sure that our, our environment is clean. We can boat in a clean environment. And there's also space in the marinas, which, as we heard in the last few days, is urgently needed. So with that, I am available afterwards for questions, also directly. Uh, I will hand the floor over to Andy Kontodakis from the European Commission, who will now say a few words also on the initial response from the European Commission. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning to all, and thank you for having me here today. Uh, um, uh, our unit in DG Mare, the European Commission, uh, let's say, department that deals with uh, maritime innovation, knowledge and uh, financing and investments, is here today because we have been uh, recipients of this industry's uh, uh, recommendations. We have been recipients and we have uh, uh, been a long time ago uh, um, uh, in contact with this industry, with the association, to hear out the problems of the industry and try to find mutual beneficial solutions or point the industry to the right direction. And I'm here today with you to present you with some preliminary remarks. It will be very non-committal because uh, uh, we have received uh, the recommendations of uh, uh, the industry only recently, uh, December, a month ago is too soon for commission processes, of course, and we will be, uh, you know, replying formally to them in the next period of time. But I would like to share some preliminary uh, insights, let's say, and uh, information. And uh, share with you uh, that we are uh, indeed very pleased to see the work of the uh, group, to see that the group produced uh, this work, uh, which is easy to understand. The issues they put forward are clear and there needs to be uh, uh, potential solutions to them, which some of them, most of them, I would say, could be easily facilitated. Uh, we are very pleased to see that the, uh, the boating industry is keen to play a, a, a full part in fulfilling the objectives of the Green Deal, in going green, in going uh, more uh, efficient, and uh, act as an instigator it, 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 to, to these uh, challenges. It is not afraid to change. Uh, the recommendations, as I said, uh, will be uh, um, scrutinized. They are now scrutinized, but uh, 
the replies I'm going to give you today are not definite, uh, definitive, of course. I would already like to give you some background as to the, uh, um, uh, let's say, uh, information uh, uh, on the Commission activities and what the Commission is committed to do in the near future in each of the areas identified in this uh, uh, roadmap. Uh, uh, I can already say that most of them uh, will be tackled and can be tackled through the regulatory environment we have in place, through the legislation that we have in place, and some pieces of le legislation that we are now uh, uh, we're currently revising. So, your first point was about, uh, of course, the first observation was uh, uh, very correctly pointing towards uh, the financing barriers, if you like. And uh, uh, there, you would indeed uh, need uh, uh, financing organizations and mobilize organizations and different bodies at national or uh, regional level schemes to provide the necessary financing for the operation for the dismantling op operations. Uh, you are aware, of course, of the polluter pays principle. You know that it is primarily, uh, let's say, uh, the manufacturer or the importer that needs to bear and finance the responsibility of dismantling. But because of the wide variety of uh, recreational bow types and because of the uh, challenges of the different materials, uh, uh, waste materials coming uh, out uh, of them, EU funding on uh, through piloting schemes, let's say, is indeed justified, could be very uh, much justified. And there are avenues for that. I just point to some uh, uh, financing vehicles, the very, uh, let's say, uh, known financing uh, vehicles that we have. My first, uh, uh, let's say, suggestion uh, would be to look uh, uh, into uh, the newly established Mission Ocean under the vast research program of the European Commission Horizon Europe. There, we have set as one of the main objectives of the mission the reduction of pollution. And is, the mission is focusing indeed on bringing the various uh, stakeholders together to tackle these problems through proposal of specific demonstration projects that could give an answer to these uh, problematics. And there, under the Mission Ocean and the innovation potential that we are trying to, uh, uh, to bring forward through that, I see many opportunities for putting forward uh, solutions and ideas like that for uh, uh, financing through uh, Mission Ocean, uh, through this program strand of Horizon Europe. Then you have the LIFE program the environmental uh, uh, program, uh, EU program. And there you have a specific sub-program that tackles circular economy and uh, quality uh, of life. This program strand uh, dispenses around 600, uh, 600 million uh, uh, euros per year, and it can support close to market solutions. So it's up to stakeholders to group uh, uh, you know, their problems together and propose a, a, a satisfactory approach under program, under this program, life program, and you could have your project uh, supported uh, through funds from there. We have seen under life, for example, a recent uh, recycling, uh, let's say, scheme being supported for recycling of uh, uh, shoes, uh, used shoes. So I do not see why uh, not voting industry could not be a recipient out of this program. Of course, major, uh, uh, let's say, uh, uh, investment uh, branch for us is, has always been and will continue to be the European Investment Bank through its various uh, uh, financing products. The bank, of course, and its affiliate, the European Investment Fund, uh, which tackles uh, small and medium-sized enterprises mostly, have a commitment towards circular economy, have a commitment towards greening, uh, uh, financing the greening of the European economy. It has already spent $2 billion in the past five years, so uh, uh, it would, of course, this being an investment bag, it mostly needs to see return on its investments, but through the InvestEU 
program that we have set up, uh, the Commission is now providing EU guarantees to EIB to support those and scale up uh, those startup uh, projects or scale up those projects that can be uh, a little bit risky in terms of market uh, development. Uh, projects that others might find it a little bit difficult to, uh, to fund. So it could be there, an avenue there for you to explore and seek the, uh, uh, um, either advice services and technical support services under the advisory hub of EIB or going directly uh, for loans that can be backed by EU guarantees. And last but not least, we have our European Maritime and Fisheries Fund, which dispenses support for activities like the dismantling of, uh, uh, bo um, uh, of boats, pleasure boats, and uh, uh, last but not least, our Blue Invest, the dedicated fund that we have set out under our uh, Maritime Fund for uh, uh, helping, supporting SMEs to scale up their business, to provide them with technical uh, assistance to bring up projects uh, uh, on stream and so on and so forth. Interreg, another uh, source, uh, potential uh, source of uh, funding because it brings particularly regions and cities closer together to tackle common projects, uh, uh, common problems through projects and scrapping uh, of uh, leisure boats it's a regional activity and could aggregate regional actors together to opt for an interreg uh, uh, project funding and so on and so forth. The second point that you raised in your uh, recommendation was about dismantling and uh, transport, of course. And uh, there, uh, uh, we have two major, uh, let's say, uh, uh, doors uh, uh, to, to, to enter into this uh, whole problematic. We have, as you uh, are aware, I suppose, we are currently tackling uh, the revision uh, uh, of the work under these uh, two uh, uh, pieces of legislation, the Waste Framework Directive and the Waste Shipment Regulation, as Philip has mentioned uh, before. Uh, the first one, the uh, Waste Framework Directive, currently under uh, revision, it is at the moment focusing and uh, uh, you know pushing forward for food and textile waste, but we are also going to look into industrial and commercial uh, waste as well. And uh, our colleagues in DG Environment uh, would uh, be very glad and would invite you actually to share your detailed views so that they can take account of that and help them uh, calibrate well uh, uh, their assessment and their revision of this uh, directive. And we can, of course, as DG Mare, uh, be, uh, be there to help set up the uh, links necessary and the meetings uh, that we need to, to do for this reason. For the waste uh, shipment regulation and their, uh, the provisions uh, in it, uh, you are right in pointing out that there might not be enough business in one uh, country to justify the recycling uh, plants uh, uh, being set up. But waste uh, could be the uh, subject to uh, any waste to rules under the waste uh, shipment regulation. So, how do you go about this uh, uh, conundrum? Uh, since hazardous material uh, waste or mixed waste uh, uh, provisions are uh, indeed much more uh, stringent, stringent and they require uh, a, a prior notification and consent, uh, uh, this is something that we do not see it changing anytime soon. You still need to go through this. So the treatment of uh, waste in your uh, case of mixed waste, is subject to permitting uh, requirements. And of course, we, would not, we could not see why not a marina could not be able to obtain such a permit. That would be pretty straightforward, uh, we feel. And since we're asking for a in EU waste uh, shipment regulation uh, 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 rethinking uh, during uh, the, the current uh, revision, we could mostly say that uh, this one being under revision as we speak 
and being subject to uh, 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 the report from the European Parliament, which was provided only last uh, week from what I uh, know, we do not expect to see any change on the proposals on mixed waste. So this means practically that you do not, that you do you will continue to need a prior notification uh, as regards mixed waste and we could not see any uh, way around it uh, for the time being. Further on, you're talking about the recycling and, uh, and your views on it. Uh, your report, I must say, uh, looks like the way forward, indeed. And uh, 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 it is true that it, uh, it will come uh, upstream huge quantities of end of life, uh, life composite, uh, either from the boating industry or from wind turbines. So this, uh, uh, these two sectors would need to come together to build economies of scale and to build impact so that they can push to the right direction. The financing of the uh, recycling plants, I referred previously to the IB, how this can help and how risk sharing uh, instruments uh, uh, of EIB benefiting of EU guarantees could come into uh, play. Of course, Blue Invest again can provide technical assistance to break projects to maturity and uh, uh, there we can, uh, of course, have a discussion as well. Finally, on your point on research and innovation, and there is a lot to be said, but I have already presented some uh, 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 main ideas. Uh, the EU research programs, of course, tackle uh, on mobility, tackles emissions reduction, firstly, mostly, but it does have consideration on materials science as well. You have the ETIPS, the European uh, Technology Platforms, and three of them uh, have developed together a material 2030 roadmap. And this includes the development of technologies for, energy, uh, for the reduction of energy consumption and better life cycle performance. The recreational uh, craft directive that our fellows and colleagues in DigiGrow uh, uh, handle was presented already last year and we were quite pleased with it. Of course, the uh, provisions in it, because it was, you know, 10 years ago, they're actually very recent compared to the lifetime of uh, uh, the boating industry. So uh, uh, we would need to anticipate uh, what the potential new forms of propulsion in a recreational boating would bring about, like batteries, uh, electricity uh, propulsion, etc., etc. For, for us, it would be too immature to start a revision process already. Uh, but it doesn't harm to start beginning thinking about it, to start this discussion with DigiGrow with us in terms of changes that could be implemented in the long run. DigiGrow is sympathetic to this idea and they would welcome any circular uh, concepts that we could include and we could suggest in terms of uh, the, uh, the boating industry to see further what can be done. And of course, I will close it here by saying that uh, uh, we are very pleased with the competences of the boating industry and the uh, uh, recommendations brought forward and the very supportive uh, view they have on uh, uh, the legislation and how they can support, uh, you know, bringing legislation up to uh, uh, standards uh, each time. We are very pleased to see the openness of your idea, your commitment to the objectives of the Green Deal, and of course, uh, uh, the setup of the EU network on end of life uh, uh, boats could be an open, uh, let's say, platform for dialogue for us. We would be very happy to facilitate that, and we could continue sharing it with EIB, the European um, um, uh, Bank, uh, and be in discussion with you. With this, I would like to thank you very, very much for uh, bearing with my uh, policy and uh, European legislation talk, and I am yours later on. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Andy. We will see you later in the, in the panel. Thank you very much.